to some of you morning, some of you afternoon, some of you evening. I hope uh, your days have been going well. My name is Lilian Wanziga Mupende. I'm the NAP project lead uh, for GGGI Rwanda program. And I would like to welcome you to today's event on green buildings, uh, focusing on practices and circular materials in Africa. This is hosted by the Global Green Growth Institute. And today's event is part of the Global Green Growth Week, uh, GGGI's annual global conference designed to promote knowledge sharing uh, on the green growth agenda. This uh, conference is organized in the margins of the GGGI's assembly and council joint sessions. This year's event will take place under the theme of unlocking the potential of green growth and climate finance innovations. Uh, before we start, I would like to give a few quick uh, housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, while GGGI is pleased to host the event and to provide support for the events, the content and opinions expressed are those of the panelists or the presenters. I would like to remind all presenters to please keep your microphone on only during the presentation, then on mute when you're not speaking. For other participants, please always mute your microphone. Uh, this will minimize background noise. Uh, thirdly, please note that the event is being recorded uh, and the recordings will be available on the event website after the events. Uh, simultaneous interpretation is available in English, French, and Spanish. You may click the globe icon at the bottom of the menu bar to choose your preferred language. If you want to hear the original presentation, please choose off. Uh, lastly, please feel free to leave your questions or comments in the Q&A board or chat room, and we will address the questions in the Q&A uh, session. If you have any technical questions, please type them in the chat room and our colleagues uh, will uh, assist you accordingly. Before I invite uh, Ms. Helena MacLeod, our Deputy Director General, and head of GGP and I uh, to make her opening remarks. We will receive welcome remarks from our president and chair, Mr. Ban Ki Moon. Excellencies, distinguished participants and guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome all of you to this year's Global Green Growth Week, organized by the Global Green Growth Institute. Your participation is evidence that we, the global community, demand climate action. And I want to thank you for doing your part to drive and empower green growth. The climate crisis is perhaps the defining crisis of our times. Every year, we can read and hear more and more about the devastating impacts of extreme weather systems. And this year is proving to be one of the worst years yet with the record floods, the droughts, and the heat waves, all of which lead to displacements from homes, food crises, and wildfires that disrupt and destroy the lives of millions. We are destroying our hope for a better future, and we need to work together to save our planet. I'm pleased to know that so many of you are coming together to exchange ideas, solutions, and best practices on how to advance the implementation of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the framework which I helped establish during my time as a Secretary General of the United Nations. I'm especially pleased to know that many of you are joining from all corners of the world, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Pacific. And many of the solutions to be discussed are coming from women and indigenous communities who are most affected by climate change. I encourage you to take full advantage of Global Green Growth Week and engage with one another as green growth champions and practitioners. 
The climate crisis will require collaboration and collective action from each and every one of us because climate change knows no borders and climate change does not discriminate based on race or social class. We can transform our economies and societies and live a better future, a sustainable and inclusive future only if we work together. The challenges will be difficult and there are no shortcuts. But if we work together urgently, I think we can do it. As I have said before, there is no plan B because there is no planet B either. I hope you will join me to make the world a better place for future generations. I wish you very fruitful and successful events during Global Green Growth Week. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, uh, GI. Without further ado, please allow me to invite DDG Helena to make her opening remarks. Fantastic, and thank you. I'm coming to you from Seoul. I haven't got the backdrop because it really just uh, completely lost me in, uh, in a, a blanket of whiteness. So I'm just at home in my apartment. It's a, it's a, a, a Tuesday evening, and I welcome you wherever you are on the planet. And I do love our president and chair's words, um, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, when he says there's no plan B because there's no planet B. Um, and I really feel that we all have to step up and find our ultimate leaders within ourselves to contribute everything we can at this present time to, to the challenge that the world is facing. But I'm also incredibly hopeful and excited because there are so many innovations coming through and so many of the solutions we, we have already. It's just a case of putting them into practice and accelerating them and scaling them. And this session is an exciting one. I've seen the work that um, our team in Rwanda have done in terms of green buildings and circular economy and in many of the other countries that we work in. And it really is changing the face of the countries that we work. So I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of some of the trends in Africa. Again, huge opportunity in terms of what we see. So by 2050, Africa will be home to 1.3 billion more people than it has today. That's more than half of the world's projected population growth of 2.4 billion people. This means a huge demand for buildings with 80% of those buildings that will exist in 2050 yet to be built. But this is an enormous opportunity to build right, right from today, and to create green jobs, skills and training and sustainable growth through widespread adoption of green building practices and circular building materials. GGGI, in collaboration with member governments and partners, recognises the huge opportunity the built environment presents to deliver on the aspirations set out by the Africa Union, Union Agenda 2063, for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. It's a, it's a commitment and a vision that GDGI wholeheartedly backs and seeks to deliver upon. Now, this session highlights the importance of innovation in construction material, the potential in measuring and reducing embodied carbons to the value in establishing robust building codes and energy efficiency solutions. In addition, it introduces a green building learning platform, which underscores the purpose of our knowledge sharing session during the GGG week. So I trust that this will be an engaging session with lots of learning, shared experiences and best practices in the built environment across Africa. Thank you for, par for participating with passion um, and with your ideas. And I look forward to listening what you have to share this evening. Thank you so much. Over to you, Lillian. Lillian. Thank you very much, Helena. Uh, it's truly been an honor to have you share your opening remarks, especially given the time that we kept you up till. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, today, we have a very interesting uh, uh, set of presenters, as uh, Helena uh, alluded to. We have people who are going to show us ways of innovation um, and 
possible best practices that we can be able to benchmark and scale up across the country as a whole, uh, across the continent as a whole. So this is quite a great opportunity. I'll start quickly right away with introducing our first speaker, Dr. Nali uh, Landru. He's a native from Togo. He's traveled to Europe at the age of 16 with the interest to one day solve the issue of lack of decent housing. He is now a Forbes under 30 alumni in Europe after a successful PhD at ETH Zurich, where he received the ETH silver medal. In 2019, he co-founded Oxara with his partner, Dr. Thibault, and together they are achieving the vision of green building with a goal to enable access to sustainable and affordable housing for all. He has developed a cement-free concrete made from clay-based excavation material. This is going to be a true game changer for a lot of African countries, probably across the globe as well, because we are all dealing with the challenges of housing. So I look forward to hearing uh, all about his innovation, and I'm sure that you will all enjoy his presentation as well. Nali, I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. OK. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can you still see it? Yeah. Um, today, I, I will try to speak about the topic of building the future of housing using a cement-free concrete product. My name, as mentioned, is Nyanli Landru. I'm one of the co-founders of Oxara. And our vision is uh, at Oxara is to enable access to decent, sustainable construction and affordable housing. Before going into detail, I want to stop with this picture. And for me, these pictures represent what we are trying to fight for. It's kind of an inequality that we see and that is represented by the building industry. On one side, you can see the lack of uh, um, affordable or decent housing. And as mentioned earlier, it, Africa will be home for 1.5 um, billion people that we need to figure out how to accommodate in the next future. On the other side, you see that there is um, decent home, but the choice of material used here are not coping with the current trend in terms of challenge, either economy, um, economic, environmental, and also social. And we all know that housing is of primary importance if you are trying to solve question of business opportunity, education, health, and so on. So to, uh, to kind of tackle this lack of housing, we need to look at the two major building materials that are currently used. And we are talking here about concrete and fire clay brick. Both these materials represent 10% uh, of the global CO2 emission. And it also represents 75% of resources consumed uh, each year worldwide. So we are dealing here about uh, huge climate issues in terms of CO2 emission, but also scarcity of resources, primary resources that are getting more and more scarce uh, worldwide, but also in Africa. And we need to find a way to solve this issue if we want to build new housing in the future. What is uh, our solution with Oxara? At Oxara, we have looked into what is mostly available worldwide. It's earth and clay-based uh, clay material, but also waste that is being generated by the construction industry. So we look at this resource as the future brown gold. So earth and construction waste material that we are able to transform using a um, technology that we have developed during my PhD here at, uh, in Switzerland at ETH Zurich. And this technology is a bag of what one can call a binder or additive that allows us to turn this earth material or excavation material into cement-free concrete or non-fired clay brick and blocks. And here you can see some example of uh, uh, what we can do with this additive. So one of the additive is what we call oxacrete that when added to excavation material allows us to produce 
99% um, uh, excavation based uh, concrete material and uh, oxa brick when added to produce um, a non fire clay brick. So, what is this technology bringing to the current construction industry? Before we understand the advantage, we need to look first into the current uh, process from producing either concrete and brick. And as I mentioned earlier, to produce concrete and brick, you would need cement, gravel, sand that are um, huge uh, resource depletion and CO2 emission. And on the other side, you have waste that's been landfilled. So with our technology on the concrete side, we are uh, enabling here circular economy, but yet uh, using local resources that we can find on our daily life uh, around the ground um, under our feet. And this is possible while still using similar concrete infrastructure and process. And if we look at the brick uh, process, we see that normally you need to fire it at high temperature. And with our technology, you kind of reduce or eliminate the firing process. And what does it compare with current products that are available? If we are talking about concrete, we have two different types of material that on one side help us um, to make two three-story building or uh, close to a concrete performance building, so high-rise construction. However, although we can reach similar performance, we are able to have a lower CO2 uh, reduction. We are talking here about um, 80 to 90 percent CO2 reduction for the concrete aspect. And if we are looking at about the brick, we are able to have better performance as regular brick or stabilized cement brick, yet have 60 percent CO2 reduction. So what could we expect with our technology when implemented at large scale? So here we look at what we are currently able to substitute, and it represents 20% of all the residential building. And with this 20% uh, of all the residential building, we are able to save 15% of CO2 uh, that consists of a reduction uh, compared to the global building material. And in addition to that, we are able to save a billion of ton of sand and reuse 2.1 billion of ton of uh, um, construction waste. So with that, we believe uh, that our technology here not only allows to reduce CO2, but also when implemented at scale, allows us a first estimate to reduce the cost up to 20%, therefore enable access to sustainable housing, but also um, decent housing for all. On that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nyali. That was a very succinct and very uh, interesting uh, presentation. I know that we will have quite a lot of questions uh, at the end of uh, all the other presentations joined together. I'll quickly pick out a few things that you highlighted that are very critical to our session today. Um, the fact that concrete and uh, brick uh, manufacturing contribute 10% um, of CO2 emissions, and on top of that, contribute to 75% of resources that need to be consumed to be able to uh, generate um, concrete or uh, fired bricks. Uh, I think it's also very interesting that you said that we can be able to use um, uh, waste, construction waste material, because then this introduces the element of circular economy, and we are able to then also reduce the amount of waste that we have to deposit into our uh, landfills. Um, I love the idea of eliminating the firing process because this is also one of the ways in which we contribute to CO2, uh, to CO2 emissions and destruction of our environment uh, as a whole. And uh, I think what's most important is that even as you save on sand, which is a typical construction material, you can still guarantee the strength of um, the bricks that you're presenting to the construction industry. And at the end, also able to eliminate uh, or to reduce the cost by about uh, 20%. This is quite an amazing innovation. I look forward to further discussion when we open up for Q&A. Thank you once again. And um, we'll move to our next speaker. Thank you. Um, our next speaker today is Noella Nibakuze. Uh, she's a design director at Mas Kigali Studio, leading architectural design, construction administration, building technology and sustainability. 
She has a deep commitment to projects and partners that have a positive impact on the communities that they serve. She works to improve people's lives uh, through built environments that promote sustainability and justice. She holds a master's degree in architectural technology from the Tuane University of Technology in Pretoria. Uh, Noella, I uh, welcome you to make your presentation. Thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, not sure what's going on with my camera. I hope you can see me. Yes, looks a bit at a distance, but um, uh, you can adjust. After the presentation, maybe you can adjust your screen um, to, to zoom in a bit closer. Thank you. It's correct. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, thank you. I'll be presenting to you um, a toolkit to produce uh, of measuring and reducing embodied carbon um, in Rwanda in the built environment. Um, as Lillian mentioned, um, I'm a director with Mass Design Group, and we believe that design is never, neutral, is never neutral, it either hurts or heals. And our mission is to research, build, and advocate for architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. So we are an office of about 250 plus architects, uh, engineers, landscape architects. We have filmmakers, uh, we have um, construction uh, engineers as well. Um, so our, like it's written here, our first and largest and longest running project, uh, obviously the design of our practice. Um, so we work around the world. We have offices in the US, in Boston, Poughkeepsie, and Santa Fe, but also offices in Rwanda. Uh, we're in, in, in Africa, we're in Rwanda, we have our largest office in Kigali. We also have offices in South Africa, and we are a diverse group of about 20 nationalities. Uh, sorry to uh, cut you short, Noella. Uh, we seem to be losing your voice. Um, uh, the sound is not too clear. I don't know if you can be able to uh, adjust your microphone or uh, increase the volume so that we can be able to catch your uh, your your sound well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just give me one. Sorry about that. I hope this is much better. Um, as, yes, I think that's I'll, much better. Great. As I was explaining, uh, I'll be presenting to you a toolkit for the built environment practitioners to measure and reduce embodied carbon in Rwanda. So this is a project we've been working on uh, for the last year together with Arup, and where the initial phase was really to create awareness among other practitioners, architects, engineers about embodied carbon, how to measure it, and especially how to reduce it uh, in our construction and buildings, et cetera. We just started our second year where we're hoping to include other professionals as well, the government, manufacturers, and, and students, uh, et cetera. So starting on this presentation, uh, as already mentioned, we need to Limit our global warming to 1.5 degrees by 200 and 2,100. And that means that we need to reduce uh, our net emission of CO2 by half in 2030 and by zero in 2050. So what does that mean for the construction industry? Uh, we've already noticed in East Africa and in Rwanda as well, the consequences of climate change and global warming um, where we have experienced extreme heat, uh, which leads to um, droughts, but also extreme rains as well, uh, which damage uh, infrastructure such as roads, bridges, and electricity supplies. Um, and particularly in Rwanda and Mali, uh, we have been ex experiencing uh, global warming, heavy rains, and also droughts, um, especially in the south. Uh, we know that buildings contribute to about 40% um, of CO2, 28% from the building operation, and 11% uh, from construction. And for a long time, we have been really focused on the operations and given less importance of construction. We're actually, as architects, we have more control 
building construction and building operation for us. So you can imagine when the building is taken over, anything can happen. Um, so we need to do things right from the beginning. Um, also, we need to notice that in Africa, uh, we'll be building more than any other regions uh, in the next four years. Um, that means that, especially on the continent, we need to be more careful on how we build it. Everyone is responsible, um, not only architects, um, but also policy makers and manufacturers, um, investors, um, everyone who is there. Uh, a few methods on how to reduce embodied carbon. Uh, you, we can start by building less. Uh, that means maybe it's to consider a new building. You can renovate or retrofit what is already existing. So instead of demolishing, uh, to construct for reuse, uh, using uh, low embodied carbon materials that are um, sourced uh, efficiently and require less intensivity, intensivity in terms of uh, of production, uh, and that means local materials, especially uh, as much as you can. So I can give a couple of examples on how we have achieved uh, a few of those in some of our projects, like RICA, the Rwanda Institute for Preservation Agriculture, where we really maximize the use of local materials by using about 96% by weight uh, of the entire building for local materials but also um, using materials that will require less finishes. That means building less if you can expose your structure as much as you can and no embodied carbon like stone, timber, and earth that you will use on this building. Our recently completed uh, building, no pin in Kigali, in the city of Kigali, where we also, this one, we, we just adapted, we reused existing buildings and transformed them instead of demolishing. And some of the materials um, that were demolished were actually sal salvaged and reused uh, for this new construction, as you can see on the picture. We also did a few calculations, uh, not a few, a lot of calculations at the beginning to see if we can use steel instead of concrete, where we realized that using a steel structure is actually less embodied carbon, especially that at the end of its life, we can reuse this steel uh, somewhere else. The Nyarigenge Hospital uh, in Namirambo, in Nyarigenge, where uh, it's um, about 7,000 square meters, where because of the nature of the building, we were constrained on using reinforced concrete for all external walls, but we used uh, earth blocks uh, for all our internal partitions that did not require to be fired uh, in order to reduce the CO2 on this project uh, particularly. And in terms of maintenance, we added with bricks as much as we can so that we do not need a lot of maintenance um, during the use of the building. So the case studies we use for this toolkit, uh, we chose these four buildings because um, we also worked with the University of Rwanda, so we wanted to use buildings that were very well known by the students, but also uh, by everyone in the profession. So the School of Architecture, uh, which is mostly uh, constructed with reinforced concrete, making about 87% of its embodied carbon uh, up front. Rika, which I just presented to you, which used a lot of earth and timber uh, and stone. And you will see on the graph below that it's in life, uh, the biogenic carbon storage actually contributes to the positivity uh, of the climate. The Rwanda Cricket Stadium, which is also a very good example of uh, the structure. Um, it's really made up by compressed, stabilized solid health that were mortared together and they were all sourced really close to the, to the building. It does not have any finishing, so it's a good example of building less. Uh, we also have the School of Mining, um, also made of uh, reinforced concrete. It's a two-floor building um, and it contains office buildings, lecture rooms and museums. So by comparing this building, uh, the School of Mining uh, was the highest, um, especially because of the concrete used. Uh, but I would like to highlight from Rika uh, because of the biogenic storage in the timber use, uh, they actually contribute. Um, it, it, not only it's negative to, the, to, to its carbon emission, but it puts back oxygen uh, 
uh, to the atmosphere. So, which actually we might regard uh, climate positive um, in the reporting. The cricket stadium is the least because as we have seen, it's, it, it only really used uh, soil and really um, no, no, no other materials at all. Um, so this is um, a comparison without really um, naming the project. Um, for, um, for privacy, I can say that. But just as an example, it will take like the size of these red dots, uh, just planting trees on this entire size to offset uh, the CO2 emission from this uh, one construction project here. But it's really big because this, this building um, is naturally big. Um, but when we normalize by floor area, you can see it does not contribute as much. Uh, this is still by the large cycle stages um, from material production to the end of life, where you can see that most of the embodied carbon is actually during material production, which is between 50 to 70 percent, but also during the use of the building. And this includes the replacement of, of probably your finishes of your building and when you are renovating or replacing some damaged um, pieces. Uh, so by just comparing from material to the end of construction, not the end of life, uh, we typically in literature, you will see that buildings should be between 300 and 600, but the ones we measured, they were all quite higher uh, than what's supposed to be, uh, what's in the literature. And again, it, it was between the material production and this long one is again, uh, the school of mining. So we also if we can if we can kindly draw to a close so that we can allow for adequate time for Q and A. Anything that you've not been able to share, we can have uh, also during the Q and A session. So kindly uh, wrap up in one minute. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. So we also compared in terms of structure, and the superstructure was the highest, being between fifty and eighty percent of the embodied carbon of the structure. And also in terms of materials, uh, concrete and steel being the highest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noella. Quite an interesting uh, presentation there. I think uh, very appropriate following uh, Nali's uh, initial um, introduction into the value of uh, uh, selection of construction material. I like the fact that you emphasize the importance of transitioning from material production into biogenic storage to transportation, construction in use, and actually looking at the end of life um, when we're discussing the choice of construction materials. Um, I like the fact that you've introduced a tool that we can actually tangibly use to measure um, uh, how we can reduce embodied carbons. And it's very interesting to see the different types of projects you've been involved in that have actually uh, tested this or put this to test um, in our environment. I think it's important for us all to note that, um, as you said, you brought in into uh, introduction a very important statistic. 40% of CO2 emissions come from the built environment. Um, and if we don't do anything about this, um, then it comes back to the question of, are we building better? Um, are we actually uh, building nothing, building less, building clever, building efficiently? We need to start to assess this in order to ensure that um, we are able to um, plan for a more sustainable built environment. I like the fact that you highlighted um, that some of the demolished uh, materials that you used on your site were salvaged. And this is quite uh, reflectant of uh, what Oxara is also trying to do. How are they able or how are we able to recycle uh, used construction material to be able to translate into a usable project? Uh, or a usable uh, product moving forward. Thank you very much for that presentation, Noella, and I look forward to questions from our different uh, participants online. Uh, please allow me then to introduce our next speaker, which I think is um, quite a good segue from the two earlier presentations. We're now introducing the value or the importance of uh, building codes and establishing standards that can guide the kind of sustainable building uh, we require. Uh, George Asimwe is the Senior Urban Development Officer for GGGI Uganda. He has a Bachelor of Environment Management from Makere University 
and a master's in urban development from the Norwegian University, Science of, uh, University of Science and Technology. He's been involved for over 10 years in designing policies, strategies, regulations, and structuring bankable projects in the sustainable development and green growth sectors. He's currently overseeing the amendment of the national building codes and the spatial planning of secondary cities under the EU funded project that is greening Uganda's urbanization and industrialization. We look forward to hearing from you, George. Uh, I hand uh, over the session to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lillian, for that very good introduction, myself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session and uh, congratulations to all the previous speakers. As Lillian has ably introduced my session, I'm going to be highlighting more uh, on the link between policy and practice and how it's linked to uh, the use of material and the penetration of the uh, concept of green buildings. Uh, we'll restrict myself to the, the work that we're doing in Uganda under the project funded by the European Union called Greening Uganda's Urbanization and Industrialization. And just one element of it, which is concerned with the promoting circularity in the built environment. Uh, I must also recognize that this is work that we are doing jointly with the Green Building Council of Uganda, uh, the Ministry of Works uh, and Transport, and the National Building Review Board of Uganda. So what are we doing? Uh, we've been doing a deep dive on the national building laws in Uganda and uh, assessing the compliance of the National Building Code to the environmental protection or the concept of circularity. Uh, so in the last uh, one year, over the last one year period, we've undertaken a deep dive in conjunction with the Uganda Green Building Council of the entire building architecture, the regulatory framework, the legal and uh, statutory framework. And we found uh, that in Uganda, uh, we have a national building code, we have a national building control act, and part five of the code actually speaks to environment protection and energy efficiency. However, we found that uh, these elements of environmental protection and energy efficiency are largely isolated from the rest of the code. They are ambitious and uh, require capacity building because they seem a bit alien to the context that we're speaking about in Uganda. They are complex to be easily implemented and they lack clear actions uh, for the user of the code. And in some cases, they are insufficient to be able to address the issues of energy and some aspects of mechanical uh, engineering. So uh, what have we done? We did this review, as I talked about, and came up with a position paper and a policy gap analysis, which we discussed uh, extensively with all stakeholders, and then eventually uh, reviewed with the National Building Review Board, and uh, consequently had our uh, proposal submitted. Uh, we have also gone ahead in light of this, based on the findings of the policy gap analysis and the position paper, to actually now begin a process of amending the law and the codes and the standards. And this is work that is ongoing. We hope that as you can see from the timeline, uh, we should be able to bring it to a close with the consequent amendments to the law uh, by January, 2023. Um, so in the meantime, what have we done? Uh, we've undertaken some green building awareness workshops, uh, convening all different stakeholders, engineers, architects, uh, developers, real estate actors, policy makers. Uh, we've gone out into the secondary cities and trained building committees, which are responsible for approval of building plans. We've also extended the trainings to the uh, fiscal planning committee because uh, our fiscal planning committees must approve before the building committees approve a project, a construction project. So we've been trying to build their capacity to actually understand the concept of green building, the concept of incorporating circularity and the benefits 
that accrue as a result of that. We've extended, we've in fact trained over 150 uh, practitioners. We've uh, had specific trainings for private sector and we've done about six uh, secondary cities, uh, but this is just a stone throw because we have 10 secondary cities and we have 130 municipalities and so many local governments. So it's just the tip of the iceberg we're talking about. Uh, we've gone ahead to do to develop the green buildings training module, which we are now beginning to pilot. Uh, recently, we've uh, extended the training to engineers, architects, and designers and design houses who actually gave us feedback and indicated that if we could embed uh, more of these trainings in the work we do and promote this concept, then perhaps at the design level, uh, these companies can be able to incorporate some of these aspects. But they also indicated to us that the concept was not easily understandable because of the lack of a clear regulatory and legal framework. So what have we done uh, beyond the trainings and capacity awareness? We've decided to find out how is the concept of circularity being implemented in Uganda? How are developers uh, working with it? How is it being uh, adopted? So we've commissioned a building survey in the metropolitan area of Kampala and in fact sampled about uh, 150 buildings, uh, including educational institutions, public uh, buildings, hospitals, hotels, arcades, uh, shopping centers and office blocks. And we're finding uh, that most of the buildings are not really informed by geographical considerations. For example, they are not oriented uh, according to you know, the, the axis of the sun, they are rather oriented according to the direction of the road. And, and, and this has huge implications for heat gains, energy efficiency, and, and other aspects of circularity, even emissions. We are also finding that uh, luckily enough, many of the buildings actually have provisions for persons with disabilities. Uh, some of the buildings are adopting uh, permeable parking surfaces, which is good. Uh, 81% of them have air conditioners. Uh, we're also finding that most of the refrigerants are really not healthy. They are full of uh, hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, it's, this is not good. Uh, so we are hoping to be able to take up some actions later on with the standards. Uh, we're finding that um, over half of the buildings are actually practicing waste sorting at source, which is a good practice. Uh, water rainwater harvesting is still at about a quarter, about a quarter percent, 25 percent, and uh, a lot of them generate energy mostly through solar and biogas. Um, and speaking solar and biogas, issues of energy efficiency, we are finding that most of the lighting options mostly used are through LED lighting, basically energy saving bulbs. Uh, that the commonest source of, of renewable energy used is solar and biogas. Although we are also finding that some of them, especially office blocks and uh, hospitals are using some light sensors, some are using appliances that are energy efficient, uh, some are using smart and automated HVAC systems, uh, but most of these relate to technologies. What is worrying is that uh, there is very little use of, say, cool roofs and green roofs. This speaks to an, a, a, an element of design, because as you can see on the technology side and all the innovations, you can see that there is high adoption. For example, when you compare LED lighting to green roofs, you can clearly see that there is very little uh, incorporation of elements of energy efficiency at design with compared to adoption of technologies that can create energy efficiency. We are also George, finding- You can um, take one minute to round up so that we get an opportunity for Q&A and um, right. any elements that uh, are critical for you to highlight, you can go ahead and do so. The rest we can uh, supplement during the Q&A session. Thank you. Fine. So water efficiency again, uh, mostly it's again technologies as opposed to design. Uh, because you can compare water efficient toilets and urinals to, for example, xeriscaping, which would easily uh, speak to the disconnect between design and uh, technology. And then we're also finding that uh, 
uh, the highest barriers to adoption of green building activities is the high upfront cost, lack of public awareness, and then lack of awareness of these codes. But on the lowest side, we are finding that uh, it's not really the risks as a uh, related to the technologies that are causing the minimal adoption. We are also not finding that it's cultural or social cultural norms, no. We're only finding that it's related to costs and awareness. So what are we proposing as I finish? We're saying we need to intensify capacity building. Uh, we need financing mechanisms and the credit lines to be extended. Luckily, there are efforts with a few banks here in Uganda trying to offer green mortgages to different developers. So we can intensify that and increase the proportion of finance credit lines to green buildings. Uh, there was an issue of record keeping because many of the buildings do not conduct energy audits. And then even those that do, do not have proper records of this. And then professional bodies lack a one-stop center where they can access some of these tools, policies and regulations. And essentially behavior change is key to uh, attaining this transition. So as I conclude, if there is anything to take away from my small short presentation is that green buildings um, right now, and the transition is anchored mostly on technology, but we, we need to see more of it embedded in design and in structure. And I think that will help to move the transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. I like your closing uh, remark. We have to focus on uh, design and uh, structure. I think that's the same uh, position that uh, Noella started on, the value of getting the design right, uh, the choice of materials right. I think it was um, interesting that you, you emphasized the importance of creating the link between policy, strategy, and actual practice. Uh, a lot of times we have very ambitious policies like you highlighted, uh, but then clear action doesn't come out of these policies so that uh, pr practitioners can actually implement what um, the policy desires to achieve or, or, or um, aspires to achieve. Uh, we need to be able to ensure that our regulatory frame frameworks are very clear uh, and, and, and show us where to go, how to go, uh, and uh, what needs to be done. I think I appreciate the fact that you've also pl uh, placed quite a bit of focus on technical training. Uh, and awareness. Uh, as you said, behavioral change is very critical. Without that, um, you'll always get a pushback. People will not understand the value that comes from shifting towards uh, green buildings. Uh, and I, I, I think it's quite a, a commendable uh, effort that you're actually introducing a training module. And I see this kind of training module uh, touching upon the use of local materials, which was emphasized by both Nali and uh, Noella. Uh, this module can also introduce elements of being able to measure. You can use the kind of toolkits that um, Noella was mentioning to be able to measure uh, the carbon emissions and, and um, uh, how efficient and how um, our buildings are actually meeting the, the standards that we desire. Uh, you also mentioned something about energy efficiency and water efficiency, which I think is a good point to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Madi Kabore is the senior energy associate. Um, his role is to support the coordination of the KCEP funded cool social housing energy efficiency project SeaShip in Burkina Faso. Madi, you've given me the toughest uh, test with that um, project title, but I hope I have clearly introduced this. He will be responsible, um, he's responsible for driving the consolidation of energy efficiency uh, cooling solutions uh, in consultation with stakeholders. Uh, this includes conducting required assessments, consolidating best practices and experiences on active MEPS and uh, passive cooling in Burkina Faso and the region. Uh, he comes out of our um, uh, Burkina Faso office, uh, GGGI office, and he is an EDGE certified expert, holds an MSc in energy and industrial processes at 2IE, He's also a PhD holder in uh, energy and building sciences from the University of Grenoble Apples, which is in France. And uh, he holds project management certificate uh, France. Uh, over to you, uh, Madi. Looking forward to hearing from you. Um, thank you, Lilian, for the presentation. And uh, thank you to all the participants for attending and the organizer as well. Uh, we are going uh, to present uh, 
the result of a field survey uh, conducted in Burkina Faso. Uh, it's uh, related to the state of play of uh, cooling appliances and also access to passive design uh, conducted with uh, David Luré as a consultant. The agenda is about uh, context, methodology, the part of uh, active cooling appliances and also a part uh, related to the uh, access to passive cooling design by as household. Concerning the context, it's uh, about uh, the future demand uh, of uh, energy for cooling in the building sector, in particular in uh, hot countries. And uh, we can see that uh, the actual access to air conditioning unit is very low, but uh, uh, by 2050, uh, around uh, over 60% of us all in the world could have access uh, to air conditioners, even in Africa, due to the population growth and also uh, to income growth. And action to reduce this future impact on energy demand led on uh, the performance of uh, the building envelope and also the performance of technologies. And uh, we are promoting these uh, actions in the frame of the social housing energy efficiency, energy efficient cooling project in Burkina Faso, uh, funded by the Clean Climate uh, Collaborative and in partnership with the Ministry of Urbanization and Housing and Cities. The methodology used to conduct this uh, survey, uh, we focus on cooling appliances, uh, farms, and individual air conditioning system and also passive design. Uh, as all survey and also market uh, surveys. And uh, we are able to come to survey the, around uh, 1,000 households physically in three climatic zones of Burkina Faso, uh, the ASVAC suppliers, and uh, also the professional architects, engineer, and ac academia actors as well. And the survey follow the different specification for a national statistic survey in Burkina Faso. The first point concerning the cooling appliances in Burkina Faso, uh, the main cooling uh, appliance accessible to uh, quite uh, a large amount of us all is the funds for thermal comfort, which uh, consists of uh, increasing the uh, air speed. Uh, in order to reduce the heat stress. And we can notice that uh, from the market, the importations grow around 200% between, uh, between 2016 uh, to 2020 compared to 2011 and 2015. Uh, and uh, the importation of air conditioning system, the individual ones, grow around 40%. This can be explained by the trends of Burkina economy during this period. And also, uh, the market is also characterized by high global warming potential refrigerants used in the AC system. We found also from uh, the uh, uh, tax, of, tax office uh, so survey that uh, ACs uh, are considered as luxury appliances. So the tax rate is around. Uh, 40%. One uh, cooling appliances also used is a uh, humidifier, which use an evaporative uh, 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 principle to uh, cool the air. In terms of energy efficiency, uh, AC system, for example, are characterized by the energy efficiency ratio. Here is uh, uh, some brands. We, we, we surveyed in the market and we tried to compare uh, the different energy efficiency ratio. And we noticed that uh, all a uh, huge uh, part of uh, the ACs are, have uh, the energy efficiency ratio below three, which uh, can be considered with the actual technology and performances as an efficient uh, um, uh, AC uh, system. And uh, if we compare with uh, the ongoing uh, minimum energy performance standard adopted at uh, the regional level and uh, not yet implemented in Burkina, 
we can note that uh, main of the main of the large amount of part of the AC system we meet in the market uh, will be with uh, one star, meaning a class one or two star. A few of them will have a uh, three stars. So, and also actually the market is not regulated as at all. For the origin of the uh, cooling appliances, um, mainly from Asia and Europe. And what we can, uh, we, we notice from the literature review is that, uh, for example, in uh, uh, China or India, Malaysia, they already have minimum energy performance standards, which are ambitious. And the most of the equipment come from this country, but the actual efficiency, these uh, the actual uh, appliances, for example, AC system we have in Burkina market can be sold in the origin market. And this is uh, an evidence of uh, environmental dumping, which is a, a, a very uh, a, a characteristic of the uh, cooling appliances in worldwide and a very, uh, uh, this, this is a, a very, very, very uh, an issue uh, uh, countries in Burkina, uh, in Burkina and also in Africa have to address because we have also some survey in Ghana with the same characteristic evidence the environmental dumping. Uh, concerning the access uh, to cooling appliances by, by, by uh, household, we found that uh, at national level, the access to air conditioner are quite low, almost 4%. And uh, the funds uh, are the main, uh, the more accessible cooling appliances by the household, and humidifier uh, are also uh, low. Concerning the condition to uh, to purchase, uh, people uh, prefer uh, purchasing the brand new uh, appliances, cooling appliances, and the method uh, prefer is cash. And um, in the frame of the project, we have to develop a financial. Uh, uh, models in order to increase the access. And this uh, uh, lead us uh, to quite uh, find a way how we can design uh, this kind of financial model. If the market is characterized by a cash dominated method, we can act uh, on a detection as financial solution. Uh, but this is challenging the fact that uh, uh, the tax at uh, the regional uh, level, a covers level, on, for example, AC is, is around uh, 40 percent. So uh, one solution uh, we can we have here is on bills financing uh, with an uh, an ESCO services uh, where we can uh, the, the can help, for example, an ESCO to acquire an efficient um, air conditioner, but uh, we the ESCO will use the electricity bills to get payback. Some key findings uh, from the ASVAC uh, survey. Uh, we have uh, the existence of a specific reference in the market, which do not meet the maps of the imported country. Uh, if this is the environmental dumping. Uh, issues on technical specification of the, of the appliances. A large proportion of inefficient uh, uh, appliances. And also we can notice the growing use of uh, humidifiers for thermal comfort. And concerning uh, the market, uh, we can we also notice that it is not regulated at all. We notice a lot of false advertising and the market is based on uh, the brand and the technology rather on the real uh, energy performance of the appliances. For the uh, access, access to passive cooling. Uh, for the survey, we focus on some principles like uh, the cool roofing, reflective roofing or, or reflective walls to avoid overheating, the double roofing with uh, attic ventilation, and also building form and opening to enhance uh, ventilation. And also, uh, we have also the, the shading devices of uh, building exterior surfaces such as windows. Concerning the, the attic, the double roofing and uh, the ventilation, in Burkina we have uh, 
the main material used for roofing is metal, uh, galvanized steel, uh, combined with uh, a ceiling, with uh, some holes to, um, to allow the ventilation of the attic. Uh, we found that uh, most of the household use this kind, this uh, kind of technology, but the issue will remain in the size of the opening for the ventilation. So you can see in the picture that uh, we have uh, uh, the ratio of the opening compared to the wall is uh, very low and this is, is not optim optimized and cannot allow to have a good ventilation and avoid overheating from the roof. The roof uh, is contributed to around 40% of the overheating over, over of the building in our climate. For the roof color, uh, roof color, the principle used is to reflect sun radiation. And uh, we found that a uh, lot of people uh, at this question ask, uh, say that they have uh, light colors. And when we deepen this uh, quality data, we found that the, last, la the light color referred to the galvanized color of the steel roof. So uh, this one have just medium reflectance, but do not have high reflectance, we can help to uh, to avoid overeating. So uh, cool roofing solution as some kind of solution we must use to address this kind of uh, knowledge gaps. And uh, the wall color, uh, this one is uh, quite well implemented. We have some light yellow color, gray color, but uh, the wall color has less impact on thermal comfort compared, compared to the roof. But we still have uh, some cases. We have uh, on the in the figure we can see uh, you can observe black wall walls are used here in uh, the capital, and this also will have a lot of to do with overheating during the hot season. Uh, at the question, are you implementing a, a passive cooling strategy? We have some contradiction there. 60% uh, answer yes, but 57% uh, of the adults said they do not feel well natural uh, ventilation airflow in the building. And uh, so we have also some implemented issue on the shading devices. We can see on the figure the kind of uh, uh, shading devices uh, used uh, by the household. This is not well optimized. And uh, we also, uh, uh, from the survey with uh, professionals like architects and engineers, this is not uh, the focus point of the design actually uh, when uh, designing building uh, in, in the residential sector. As a conclusion, we focus on the strategy of dissemination of uh, this result and also for the next step of, uh, of our project. Uh, the first uh, target will be uh, the decision makers. We already work with uh, the government procurement officer. Uh, they ask us, request us to, uh, from the result of this uh, uh, survey, to help them to consider energy specification in the na national procurement database, uh, targeting the public uh, buildings. Also, the Building national building code revision is uh, on, is ongoing and drafted. Uh, this version will consider energy efficiency. We uh, will also support the government to operationalize the the maps, the minimum energy performance standard for cooling appliances, and uh, action also are ongoing on the incentive measures uh, where we have the challenge. Of, that the challenge is that the, 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 tax, the taxes for ACs are around 40%. And this is a huge income from the state. And so we, are, we have to address this uh, situation. And for the population, uh, an awareness campaign is under design for 2023. And uh, also for the social housing with the Minister in charge of housing, typical buildings considering passive cooling uh, uh, as dream design. And this will be the typical uh, building for the national housing programs. Because in Burkina, uh, the building sector is characterized by self-construction. 
meaning that the owner himself uh, is in the middle of a decision when building the in the building sector. So this kind of typical social housing considered passive cooling as a kind of adaptation strategy. We are working with the government. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Madi, for that uh, uh, introduction or summary into the survey and the study that you carried out. Um, I think it's very interesting to note the importance of passive uh, design because passive design con contributes significantly to passive uh, cooling, uh, especially given the fact that uh, the taxation rates that are applied to funds uh, to air conditioning is quite high at 40%. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to no note that you're recommending the introduction of unique approaches to recouping um, the cost of these ACs instead of outright taxation, uh, looking at own builds financing so that it makes it easier for homesteads to be able to purchase this equipment. Um, I like the fact that in your passive design um, uh, survey, you noted the fact that um, the ratio of openings to the building wall uh, the type of uh, uh, roofing material um, is very critical in being able to achieve uh, uh, passive ventilation or, or natural ventilation of these buildings, and, and that's quite uh, critical. I think it's also important to note the fact that uh, without minimum energy performance standards uh, that are cut across the region that are accepted as a benchmark, uh, and as a regulatory uh, framework, it makes it easy, I mean, it makes it very hard to regulate the market. Uh, and as a result, you end up uh, having issues of environmental dumping, as you emphasized. We end up uh, uh, accommodating uh, quality of um, uh, uh, equipment that does not meet uh, the required standards, uh, looking at the trajectory that we're trying to move in as a, as a continent. I like the fact that you engaged professionals, academia, and most importantly here, you introduced the role of private sector as well. They are the ones that are supplying this equipment. And so it's critical that they also understand uh, the value that comes from uh, ensuring that they are in compliance with um, energy performance standards as well. Thank you very much for that presentation. I would like to take this opportunity to invite our last presenter, uh, Mr. Olivier Aracaza. He is uh, the founder of Green Africa, which is a green building learning platform here in uh, uh, established here in Rwanda. He's an environment and conservation ent enthusiast. He graduated in construction at the Integrated Polytechnic Regional College here in Kigali, IPRC, and is currently in the final year uh, of his uh, learning at the Africa Leadership University. He'll be sharing with us uh, some insight on his platform and uh, what a better opportunity given the fact that the purpose of uh, the GGG week is to enhance knowledge sharing and um, learning across each other's successes um, as a continent and as a globe. So Olivier, I welcome you to make your presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, sorry, Olivier, you seem to have muted yourself. Uh, just uh, unmute and then start again. Thank you. Sorry. I was saying, um, once again, my name is Olivier Alcaza. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining from. Uh, what that beats for me to present my screen. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about Green Africa. Green Africa is a virtual learning platform that will help African construction practitioners to equip themselves with skills that will enable them to practice sustainable construction. So I will talk about the problem and Green Africa itself and the impact. Building operation and construction activities have been um, one of the main contributors to the global carbon emission as, as they contribute around 40 to 47% of the global carbon emission. The issue is becoming more severe in African countries where most of our construction practitioners have never been educated about print reading practices. As the infrastructure de development is taking place in, in, in different countries in Africa, um, its effect, its environmental effect um, 
uh, I mean, the environmental effect of constructing and maintaining them need to be taken more into consideration. Um, and, and that green, uh, green, the, greening the buildings should be one of the most, I mean, one of the main and top priorities. As it was stated by the theme of this meeting, and Africa is expected to be a home of, of more, more of a, a billion more, more people than the current population size now. Those people will obviously need where to reside. If we keep on the current way of doing construction, the carbon dioxide emitted from a building operation and construct, construction activity will double. And that will immensely affect the global climate. For us to sustain the need of green building by 2050, we need to have um, more, more green building professionals uh, to help us implement, uh, I mean, putting in action what we are talking about here. What well, I mean, the, the green building practices that we are talking here. If we don't have professionals, nothing will happen. We need people. Rwanda is among the top countries um, um, sorry, in Africa. Olivia. Okay, there. Uh, we were miss your slides were not changing, so um, thanks. Yeah, no, actually, uh, I was still on the previous slide. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, as it was said by the uh, by my previous uh, my previous uh, speakers, twenty seven percent coming from um, building operations and. 10% uh, from building materials and construction, other 10% coming from construction, uh, construction activities. Here are the root cause of the problem. Yeah, uh, uh, the first is green building education. Uh, 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 green building ed education is not accessible in Africa. Let me take example of Rwanda. Rwanda is among the top country that are known in Africa to promote green building. However, Finding a uh, green building practices uh, education there is, is pretty hard. Over the past months, I was doing a uh, research in, in uh, uh, around four top universities uh, that teach constructed, construction related things. And, and I found none of them which involve uh, green building uh, practices in their education. In those university, there is 800 to 1,000 engineers annually. Thus, they will produce 10,000 in 10,000 people in 10 years to come. Only 0 0.6 of those they release, that or the six percent, 0 0.6 percent, that engage in green breeding practices. Imagine if it, this is what's happening in Rwanda, what is happening in the country where the government doesn't even care about the problem. Sorry. Also, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, ignoring the fact that we have a uh, fewer number of green breeding experts that can teach and train others. And they know that they are, they are swamped and vital in the institution that they work for. Having them teaching, it, teaching in person is, it is not possible. It is not impossible. I mean, it is not possible. But if they are given an online way to share their expertise and experience with, with the rest of uh, African construction engineers, that will be effective. According to the meeting theme, the population density in Africa is expected to double by 2050. There will be a significant demand of bridging because only 20% of those needed by 2050 have already been constructed. The amount of carbon dioxide emitted from bridging operation and construction activities in Africa will, will increase to the greatest extent. If we keep the situation, we'll eventually run out of options for solving the problem because we won't, um, we won't be having sufficient number of green breeding experts available to help us address the issue. Okay. In this industry, as the word, education is, is the most significant factor. To survive and change the world, 
People need a vital education. People with good living standard and education are the foundation of the modern civilization as it enables them to apply sustainable solutions to the problems. As I said, Green Africa is a virtual learning platform that will help African construction profes professionals to acquire, uh, acquire knowledge that will help them to, to practice sustainable construction. In response to the issue, uh, to the issue of the environmental impact of construct, uh, construction activities and breeding operations, the, co the course on this platform must be designed in the, in, the African, in, in the African context. And this will impact both Africa's uh, breeding and the conservation industries. The platform will offer various courses covering all aspects of green breeding construction. For us, in order to undertake sustainable construction, construction practitioners must be equipped with uh, the necessary skills. The necessary skills, this is part of our mission to eradicate the environmental effect of infrastructure development. Uh, our, our main focus is, um, is on and construction practitioners and architects, uh, also on engineers who are now who are now at work. Also, it's it's uh, another focus is on the student as we want to change the the mindset of African construction engineers. We value the potential of education. I mean, if we don't value the potential of education, meeting the demand of of uh, for the green breeding we are required to complete by 2050 will not will not happen. We need a large number of green breeding professionals that will help us to sustain the need uh, as the contribution of, of continental carbon emission will be two times and above because of the population density in Africa in 2050. Education has always been a key to innovative solutions. Instead of relying to heavy test and exam, we base our, our education primarily on a student, a student's capa capability to create a green breeding project. Uh, yeah, to create a green breeding project. Due to the to the to the uh, to their professional experts working in Africa, we believe that instructors are the best equipped to advise students. Um, uh, on what can apply and what cannot apply in Africa. In Africa, we expect uh, we expect to rise up the number of uh, green. Uh, I mean, of uh, of engineers in Rwanda. Um, actually, we we expect to have a significant impact to the construction industry in Africa. As specifically in Rwanda, we expect uh, to rise it from below one to 30% by 2034, as, uh, as we'll be educating people around how to do green, green breeding. Dear leaders, green breeding professionals, let us work together, together to educate our people, to, I mean, so we, we can create the next generation of, green, uh, of African green breeding professionals. You're all welcome to join Green Africa. My name is Olivia Rakaza. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Olivier, for walking us through uh, the expectations of uh, Green Africa and uh, specifically emphasizing that it's a virtual platform uh, that will address issues of limited education and information among practitioners on green buildings. Um, George, maybe your green building training modules can be the start or one of the modules we should offer on this platform. I like the fact that you focused on, on it becoming a project-based learning, um, experiential-based uh, learning, and with a focus on the African context. It will be very interesting to uh, explore further how this platform works um, as we move forward. Uh, I'll kindly request all the presenters to please um, activate their video. And then depending on the question that we get from the audience and from the participants, you can then unmute and respond. I believe I already have some questions in the Q&A session. 
Um, I will kindly ask the translator, French translator, to help me read this question out. Um, it's uh, uh, written in French and therefore, unfortunately, because of my limited uh, French understanding, I won't be able to, um, to read the question out. But uh, if I can have the French interpreter kindly uh, read the question out. Thank you. In Africa, in terms of uh, sustainable development, there is always a problem of articulation between the experts and the world education world or learning world. Jacob, that means Yes, uh, can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. So I repeat, uh, in Africa, in terms of uh, sustainable development, there is always a problem of articulation. That means the link between the practitioners and the education world or learning world. That means university and uh, um, training institutions. So how to address this uh, link between the sustainable practices and the learning? And um, the second question, what should be the link between the trainer and the contextual sustainable action? Okay, thank you very much uh, for the translator. I'll read out the second question as well so that we can um, uh, try to respond to both of them at the same time. Uh, Pablo, um, the first question came, uh, I'll read it out again, yeah. Um, the first question came from uh, Georgi Tiao. I hope I've pronounced your name right. Uh, and his question is, uh, how do we balance uh, between practitioners and experts and the academia um, um, field, because when we discuss sustainable practices, a lot of times there's a loss or there's a drop um, in, in what the academia is hoping to achieve and what actual practitioners or experts are able to achieve. Uh, I'll give um, each of you a chance to just quickly, uh, you know, uh, touch upon that. Um, he also, uh, the next question looks at how are the challenges that we have in Africa similar to the ones we have in LATAM in terms of green construction? LATAM, I, I think I may need some uh, support there. I'm not quite sure. LATAM means Latin America. Latin America, super, thank you so much. So how are the challenges you have in Africa similar to the ones we have in uh, Latin America? Um, so I'll start with uh, George. George, you've worked with the practitioners quite a bit. Um, how do you see us trying to bridge the gap between what experts can bring to table and what academia uh, can also bring to table? <clears throat> uh, it's a very good question. In fact, I'll answer it with an, an illustration. Uh, we recently found that in the whole of Uganda, we have less than 150 registered architects. And, and the university, uh, the biggest university can only take in a maximum of 15 architecture students per year. Now, this goes to show you that we have very limited capacity to train professionals in this space. And as a result, we've had people who do it themselves, people who use, you know, uh, you know, masons, and 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 you know, uh, people that are less qualified to do the field. So, in practice, there needs to be a connection between uh, local knowledge, uh, traditional practice, masonry, and then educational facilities. Um, there are initiatives right now to try and upskill. Uh, people that are either certificate holders, diploma holders, to be able to come to a level where they can uh, offer a service more professionally and then also have some level of certification that allows them to apply 
their acquired knowledge, but to also be able to work with the laws that are being enacted. Because if you have only less than 150 uh, architects, and yet each building structure should be certified by a professionally licensed architect, what is the likelihood that a, pro a, a prospective builder is going to seek that architectural signature and stamp? So you can see we have a structural challenge and indeed uh, practice and education need to be able to meet each other halfway. Uh, institutes of higher learning should be able to churn out enough capacity to meet the demand that we have on the market. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, let me come to Noella. Noella, you highlighted that you do work, uh, you do quite a lot of work with the University of Rwanda and some other uh, training uh, uh, institutes. It would be good to understand from your perspective as practitioners who are actually delivering on green buildings, uh, how do you manage to bridge the gap or how have you been able to engage academia to be able to deliver um, uh, tangible results uh, in the sustainable practices? Yeah, um, thanks, Lillian. Thanks for a good question. Uh, I think this toolkit we are producing, we are currently working with the University of Rwanda, um, lecturers and students as well. Um, so that it's actually, uh, like you say, it starts uh, from school. Uh, but I think it's also important to be involved. Uh, in Rwanda, we have um, a few schools of architecture, but also engineering. So really trying to be involved in terms of lecturing, uh, which we have been doing at Mass, um, also offering internships, um, obviously. Uh, that's something also we have been involved. Um, yeah, I think in a short, really, not just having academia lecturing, but also having uh, practitioners in the real world being involved and also having some projects with students uh, like this one that we had um, lecturing and offering internships, etc. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'll just combine what both you and George have highlighted. It's important to upskill um, uh, existing uh, uh, experts. Uh, but also uh, take the practical work to the lecturing room so that you can able to be able to share the experiences, but also bring the students into the working environment at an early stage so that they can be able to um, gain experience from the internships. I think, uh, as you said, uh, George, it's critical to bridge that gap and therefore there must be um, a way to work together uh, as uh, practitioners and academia to achieve this. I'll go to the next question, which comes from Steve Brooks. Uh, he says, thank you for these fine presentations. And he addresses his question specifically to Nyali. Uh, he says, what is the source and composition of Oxara? Uh, I'm not very sure that uh, you'll be ready to share all the composition. Uh, probably you have some um, limitations on what you can share. But yes, yeah. please do give a bit of insight on uh, what is the composition of Oxara or what makes it a unique product that can respond to the challenges we have here in Africa. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's a um, good question here. Um, so in terms of composition of uh, our material, most come from the local ground that you have around. So. Uh, the 90 to 95 percent will be earth, clay, silt um, that you will find around the vicinity or in the local community. And uh, there will be one or two percent that will come mainly from a salt-based mineral that we kind of develop and uh, we can also um, purchase or buy from um, yeah, like a mineral producer and so on. And those are mineral salts that go uh, mainly like sodium, sodium sulfate, sodium silicates. So it's like minerals that are quite abundant and available that we know how to mix them together in the right proportion in order to, when combined with the local earth or the construction waste, activate and bind the whole process. So, um, uh, what is clearly our um, unique aspect is that this mineral salt can be found everywhere in the world. Um, the main challenge is to get the purity that we want, but we know that with even lower purity it can still work, but not achieve the highest performance that we want to achieve. 
So there is always a balance to understand what is the local purity of the binder or the mineral that we want. And uh, to add to the first question, I think um, from Togo, I was really, really like, I felt a little bit embarrassed that I have learned about concrete only when I arrive at the university. So for me, I think it's really important that when we try to bridge this gap, we need to bring it early on at the um, education level so that we know that we live around this building material, but we need to understand what it means and how are they made of and what um, it consists of, not in a more technical way that we could hear it at the um, university, but as a simple kid, like uh, to understand, okay, what does this mean and why are we using this material to build? And I think without that, we we'll, like not be able to solve uh, the, um, the material issue or the building technology issues. Yeah, so. Uh, I, I want to throw back uh, the, the last question. There was a question we skipped um, real quick that I think I, I will open up to all the panelists to quickly intervene if you feel you have the adequate um, experience to speak to this. How are the challenges you have in Africa similar to the ones we have in Latin America in terms of green construction? I know that um, for our colleagues, most of our colleagues here, you've probably worked across Africa. Um, maybe even in Europe. Um, I don't know if you've also had the experience to engage with Latin American uh, markets. And if you do have any insight on that, please do share. Like, uh, uh, like I, I can share our experience uh, with Oxara. So we have, uh, we are discussing currently a project in Mexico and uh, in Brazil um, and for us, what we saw is uh, on a similar range, the concern about housing issue and the fact that uh, current technology, um, either is a concrete or fire brick or cement based block would be expensive for the local community in the rural area. So they also try to use local uh, soil or um, uh, bio-based material to be able to build their houses and uh, the same way we are discussing the lack of um, uh, or the shortage of architects, it's also the same question over there because people just use traditional knowledge to build without taking into consideration all these building code, all these uh, design practices that are quite important and uh, do not necessarily understand the added value of it. So if we are not able to translate that either in Africa or in Latin America, I think we will always fight a, a, a lost battle, basically. So we need to be able to bring these uh, different actors together, yes, at early age, um, but also together during the education process or like uh, during the learning phase. So, so that when we want to build new, uh, we are aware of the new technologies available, we are uh, aware of the right way process available to be able to, uh, to reach the goal. Intervention. Thank you very much for that intervention, Nali. I'll go to the next question, which has been partially answered by George, but I will also uh, address it to Madi. Are there any incentives for individuals that would like to build eco-friendly homes for example, access to subsidized loans for green buildings. This is a question that's coming from Alan Quelly. Um, George Asimwe has uh, given a, 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 a written answer. He says, yes, there are green solutions and loans now being extended to prospective builders by a range of banks in Uganda. Uh, for example, the Housing Finance Bank, Stanbic Bank, Equity Bank, Centenary Bank, uh, and many others. And these loans are subsidized and given below market interest rates. Uh, Madi, do you see that it's the same thing in Burkina Faso and in your region as well? Yes, thank you for the floor. Yeah, in Burkina Faso, the key actor is still the state because uh, uh, people population do not have access to, to financial institutions uh, due to stability of their incomes. So for, for example, for 
uh, eco-friendly housing in the social housing programs. Uh, we have some kind of mechanism from the state uh, directly um, to the real estate uh, companies. For example, we have some subsidies uh, concerning the building material uh, for social housing program. The, the uh, real estate have uh, some kind of tax reduction when they purchase material for in the frame of the social housing programs in order to lower the cost of uh, the, the buildings. Uh, one question also, it's about uh, the challenges uh, with Latin America. In Burkina, we also have uh, a kind of similarity is uh, the informal construction. Uh, we have a lot of informal construction and here we have a kind of mechanism where the state try to formalize the informal construction in the site to do not demolish, but they try to integrate them in a kind of program. You have the kind of parcelling we, we do not uh, respect the, the, the area, the minimum area, but the state try to formalize them by uh, providing them a water system and also electricity. Uh, try uh, this is the kind of picture I have, for example, from Latin America, like uh, Rio de Janeiro, Mexico, where we have some kind of informal construction, we, uh, which are now a kind of formal because they are here since uh, 10 years, 30 years, and it's not possible to demolish and uh, move them to in order to integrate them in the main city. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, in order to take advantage of the limited time that we have left, uh, I would like to take two last questions. One is addressed directly to Olivier. Uh, Olivier, how long are the courses uh, provided by your virtual platform? Um, what is the cost for each of these different courses? And is the website already working? Uh, because uh, one of our participants has tried to access it and cannot seem to access it. Has it yet been activated? And if not, uh, when do we expect for this to be uh, activated? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think um, for the for, for the time that someone is supposed to do the course, I, I think it depends uh, on the course that you want to take. It varies from uh, six to, I mean, two, three to six months. And the course, it depends on the instructor. Uh, yeah, it hasn't started working yet, but by the end of this month, like from the 31st, that's when the platform will start to be working. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If you can, in the chat or in the Q&A session, just uh, share the link you think that uh, you'll be using for this um, platform and uh, our participants can look out for it uh, at the end of the month. Um, the last question we'll be taking is from uh, Jason. Um, the question on the platform was from Hilda Nancha. Thank you very much for that question. And the next question, which is our last for this session, is from Jason Pundu. He says, um, is it possible for a green building, uh, use of green materials uh, in green buildings to be highly earthquake resistant? Uh, I think I'll open this to all of you, but I would first of all want to hear uh, from Nyali and Noella. Um, who have been directly involved in uh, the construction of buildings and choice of building materials and introducing innovation or alternative local building materials. Uh, the question is, uh, can we be able to confirm that this, these materials or this construction approach will be uh, highly uh, resistant to earthquakes? Thank you. Uh, Nyali, you can start. Oh, yeah, thank you. So what we, we do um, is to perform major tests related to seismic behavior or earthquake behavior. So those are ongoing tests that we are currently conducting either alone as a self-standing element or in a building. But ultimately it will come with the work with the, uh, with the architect and engineer to design appropriately based on the um, characteristic of the design code that uh, the material provides. Maybe I think Noel would have more information on that as well. Uh, Noella, if you can supplement on that, given your experience in a number of different projects that Mass has uh, been involved in and uh, the use of local materials 
um, that away from the um, traditional, um, uh, the conventional concrete construction. Thank you. Yes, sure. thank you. Um, yes, so um, as you know, especially in Rwanda, we have to design uh, for seismic, uh, for seismic design, uh, because we're in a seismic zone. So I'll give an example, for example, Rika, the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture, where we use this. So all our walls, which are all structural walls, and um, either RAM dirt or CCDs, uh, are designed um, for seismic. So we did provide some gaps between the walls, so it's not too long um, in terms of width, but also in terms of height. And in fact, that's what guided um, uh, the structural grid, obviously, but also really reducing the cost because we could use some uh, modular grids. Uh, Around the whole building. Uh, I can also give an example of Nosti, which was retrofitted. So we, it was seismically retrofitted um, by using again, uh, we used again CCBs and uh, providing some gaps. So, as a short, short answer, yes, it's possible. And definitely you have to, especially in a seismic area like Rwanda. Okay. Great, uh, thank you all. Um, thank you for those uh, that feedback uh, and those answers. Uh, if you'll allow can me I, at this point, I'd like to. Can I add something? Can I add something yes, sure. really quick? Yes, go ahead. So go ahead. Um, at the end, I think it circle back to the initial question: How can we get practitioner and um, academic everyone to work? Like, it's like water by itself it's good for everyone, but if you drink too much water, it's bad. So like a building material, it's good, like in terms of design and earthquake behavior, you will have, uh, you can pass all these uh, properties, but if you design, if you have the wrong design that combine it, then you will have an earthquake issue or other type of issue. Therefore, the importance to um, focus on the right type of architecture, the right type of uh, engineer, like the mason and the right type of material in order to be able to provide decent, but also like robust uh, building for future generation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, unfortunately, we are over time, so I will not give you a one minute um, a closing uh, note to the participants, but I'm sure all your contacts uh, will be shared with the participants and they'll be available online uh, on the GGG Week uh, 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 website. Also, we will have um, uh, opportunities for anybody who's participating and would like to have a one-on-one -on -one or a follow-up you can reach out directly to our presenters uh, and acquire additional information. We will also be sharing the presentations that have been made today in case any participants would like to have follow-up uh, questions uh, with the uh, presenters and the speakers. So once again, let, allow me to thank you all. Um, your presentations really were uh, quite insightful uh, and triggered quite a bit of um, interesting uh, discussions. Uh, I believe if we had a lot more time, we would have many more um, interventions and questions uh, taken through, and we would be able to uh, assess um, the success of using uh, green buildings in the African continent and overall um, in the globe. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience uh, for joining us uh, during this event and for the questions that you have shared, uh, the insights that you have shared through the chat box and Q&A as well. Um, as I said, you may check out uh, the upcoming events uh, on the Global Green Growth Week on our website. You may find uh, other interesting sessions you would like to join, uh, but also in addition, the recordings uh, of this session, as well as uh, the presentations will be uploaded to the website later. And you can actually uh, interact on a one-on-one -on -one with any of our presenters here today. Uh, please allow me to invite uh, our regional director, uh, Dr. Male Fofana, to make the closing remarks, uh, and then uh, we will uh, close our session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lillian, and thanks also for moderating. This is quite interesting. I was just listening one hour and a half, which is really like from the different speakers, you know, the top provoking talks and contributions. Quite exciting to hear a lot of innovative approach from the different regions. So I would like to say thank you for all. Thanks for also for the presentation. And also I would like also to remind, as people mentioned that you know the building sector 
is responsible for 45% of the GHG emission in a certain way. But also what we have to understand is that, you know, many building owners, operators and finance and developers are still unaware what are the type of solutions that exist in the market. So I think it's a good opportunity as uh, people working in that sector to help them to integrate that element in the current building in a certain way. One thing I would like to say again is that when we hear about, you know, you know, wind towers, right? That reminded, you know, Egypt, you know, and in, in like 1000, one you know, before Chris year, they start building green buildings in that period. When we talk about mosques that have a green passive, you know, ventilation, you can talk about Timbuktu in West Africa, that started years, centuries ago. So what I'm trying to say is that the region's history in Africa of traditional buildings, models can also provide appropriate suggestions for design that are more energy efficient so that should be also be integrated. And one of the things that we have also to just think also is that we have to make building part of the solution of the climate change, not seeing it as a challenge, but how we can make buildings part of the solution of the climate change, which will really change the perspective that the way we're seeing the building, green building sectors. So a lot of things I hear today that is quite interesting. One is linked to zero waste in construction sector. I think it's quite important that kind of way of thinking start now or we can just reduce the waste in the construction sector, making you know, one cycle on using the waste and recycling in that sector is quite important. The second thing is there's a lot of bright ideas, but the question is how we go on a scaling up for innovative solution. A scaling up piece sometimes where we need to just add more emphasis uh, through building a right model, having the right business models that go for the scaling up that help us facilitate that part. It's quite important also to integrate. And I like the idea that was raised in the conversation. The third part I will say is all inclusive approach, you know, equal living environment, you know, from, you know, green building, luxury housing to social housing in a certain way, how we can ensure that, you know, the greening is mainstreaming from luxury housing to social housing at the same time. So all equal to make sure that everyone is involved in having the same thing, because in Africa, we'll have 200 million people living in informal settlements. It's a quite a lot. Right, and when you look at just countries like Dar es Salaam, you have 75 percent of population living in that informal settlement. So thinking about the social housing and the way that can help them to more green, but also have access to housing is quite important. The four element is also a financial instrument, right? When you have those bright ideas, project and program, you need also to make sure that you have the right financial instrument that can help you to really trigger that process. And it's like to work with financial bank also working with the government, thinking about blending finance opportunity or PPP as well, that can really help you to move from the ideation space to really come something that's going scaling up and have access to, everyone have access to that kind of opportunity. So financial instruments are quite important also to integrate because they're also part of the puzzle. The fifth element is about the policy and regulation, right? How we can set up an environment that can help really to trigger that element from the designing from zero risk for the policy in place, from how the scaling of innovation or financial instrument with the right institute. It's mean that we have to work with the policy and regulation, help them set up with the right regula regu regulation in place and pushing to have more green champion at the top level, the decision maker. So it's mean that when you have a training or awareness raising or discussion, you have not only to focus only on professional, but also focusing on policy maker, how they can understand very well the, the absolute you know, necessity to move from building to a green building you know, process and the understanding when they make some decisions regarding the policy and regulation will have a huge impact. And it's linked to the last one, which is awareness raising and capacity building that was raised during the conversation. Or is it raising because when we say building, we have to understand that building also is part of the culture heritage, right? And sometimes it's part of the culture heritage, you need also to raise awareness people saying that the way you build and the way that we can build house and homes that need in this way because that was quite important to integrate. And that will take time because culture, when it's enter and what is built in person, that will take time to take it over. So it's good to push that awareness raising through you know, campaigns, conversation, capacity buildings for the person, normal person to understand why they have to move from green and why they also, for example, change the size of the window, you know, much larger than, you know, than, than smaller. And the last thing is sort of capacity building from the professional or the architects, you know, engineer, but also uh, people in the private sector to understand very well what are the new things they have to learn, what are the key elements they need to integrate on the designing phase, on the architecture phase, so they will be up to date. And I think having some kind of platform like this where people share knowledge is quite important. 
So I was really happy to hear a lot of like good ideas, innovative approach that link to the green building. And I'm sure just, just, this is just a starting block. And there's a lot to do on that particular element. And I would encourage to have such kind of, you know, platform exchange in the coming, you know, months and year that we can create a solid, you know, innovative and group uh, that can lead to that, uh, let's say, movement to really put, you know, what I say again, building part of the solution of the climate change. So with that, I will say thank you again, and thank you for joining us for the, during the GG Week. And I hope you will have a nice evening or nice, you know, um, journey for other peoples. Thanks again for joining this session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Male. Um, I'll pick on your last uh, emphasis. Buildings should be part of the solution to climate change and not the problem. Uh, and this echoes what uh, our president and chair said in his welcoming remarks, our hope for a better future. Uh, we must look at how we do uh, things better in order to prepare for a better place for future generations as well. So thank you very much for those uh, closing remarks. Once again, I thank everybody who um, joined us in this session, all the participants, um, all the audience. Uh, specific thanks to the presenters. It was very interesting and uh, quite in engaging to listen to you. And thank you for making the time to come and, and be an active participant in this session. I anticipate that most of our participants will reach out to you individually to get um, a lot more insight and information on the work that you're doing on the ground. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, afternoon, depending uh, on the time zone you are um, at the moment. Thank you. Bye.